Welcome to this episode of Digital Disruption. Joining me on today's show is Joanna Williams. Typically invited by CEOs, founders, and HR directors, Joanna provides psychology and well-being services to executives and their teams. Now, for any business to thrive and survive, culture and the happiness and well-being of staff is a critical success factor. Operating at the meeting place of business and psychology, Joanna works with individuals and organizations to understand and navigate challenges to growth, fulfillment, and vitality. With over 20 years as a business professional combined with her career as a cognitive and behavioral psychotherapist, Joanna has a unique perspective to become a catalyst for change in a meaningful and real life way. Joanna, welcome to the Digital Disruption Podcast. So my area of expertise you know, is, is in around digital transformation. Mm-hmm. A major part of digital transformation is a cultural change and, and people. Many organizations focus on the technology piece and mm-hmm. tend to forget that it's people that are actually driving the change. So one of the first things I wanted to talk about was culture, well-being. You know, how does an organization in this modern world of technology, all the things that are going on, how does an organization go about approaching the cultural uh, challenges and improving it in a business because it's so critical to success. Well, I think what we're talking about here is is change. You know, overall, yeah. it's about change, and as I'll bring up the links it to well being. But you know, in, in a previous life, I used to work a lot on strategic initiatives, and I kind of still sometimes wear that strategy hat. And one of the things that organisations often overlook, and um, what I talk about a lot, particularly with um, with leaders and and board members around change, is the human strategic load which is the bit that seems to be to get forgotten quite often. And what people don't understand is the inherent human challenge in change. And we spend a lot of time investing in systems or processes or scaling and all that kind of stuff. The technologies you talk about, but we often overlook the human load. And that becomes a real problem when you then need to deliver and implement the change. Because what you've negated to sometimes do is consider the impact it then has, whether that be in terms of what's required of people, is there more for them to do? Um, but input, you know, what does it mean to them? What does it mean to the business and what does it mean to them? And you talk about well-being. Well, the, the thing with well-being, there's a duality here because we talk about changes in organizations and then well-being covers so many things. Yeah. Um, the link I'd make, I guess, with well-being and change is when it has an impact at a human level and it isn't managed well, what does that mean for the individual? You know, a lot of what I do is it's at the individual level. Yes, from a senior leadership point of view, but also I work with a lot of people within the organizations at an individual level that might be really struggling at a particular time. Um, and often that is because of their uh, experience of either being not being supported to adapt in a certain situation, not just personally, but mm. from a professional aspect. Yeah. So there's lots and lots goes on. And when you touch on the well-being piece, I'd say it's not separate, but there's a whole of that, you know, what is well-being to your organization um, and how much of that is about well-being as a strategic aspect of your business versus change management and how you consider the importance um, and the integration of the humanity and the, or the human element, if you like, to strategic change. So I believe that the benefits for investing in, in cultural change and investing in the well-being of your employees. Let's focus on this well-being piece. Mm-hmm. I think the benefits are, are, are obvious, but to some organizations, I still see that there's a bit of a resistance to there. So what should organizations be doing in order to ensure that the health and well-being of their employees you know, is being taken care of? What, what action should these organizations be taking? I suppose it's what does it mean to the business? You know, is it is it is it because you know part of your values and part of your part of your culture means that you want to have um well the, the term I use is how do you create psychologically safe organizations? Yeah. Um because many people in businesses feel unsafe, you know, they they, they fear failure and so yeah. the metrics that are driving these behaviors like influence that sort of stuff. So it's like safety is a big phrase that I hear a lot when, mm-hmm. I, when in the organizations that I work with definitely. Well the challenge I think it is is that um it's a distinction sometimes people make but fundamentally it is the same. It's all about relationships, yeah. Mm. And in our personal lives we consider it more reasonable to, to perhaps consider the impact we have on another person. Um in the workplace, we still consider that, but not in the same context at times. And for people to be psychologically safe, they need to feel like they belong. 
They need to feel like they are seen and they need to feel like they are heard. So with the link to change in organization, whether that be strategic change or change in general, you know, everything that's happened to us over the last 12 months, if you think about the impact of that on people, they are naturally going to respond. When they respond to those changes, how open are you to listening and really understand the impact that it's having? Mm. And when I talk to organizations about developing psychological safety, first and foremost, it's, well, establish the need. We need to establish the need and we need to diagnose what it is that you either have or you don't that's causing you problems at a cultural and well-being level. But I think it's defining for each organization, what is your need? Because for every organization at the moment, they'll say, well, yeah, we want to be into our well-being. Mental health is really important. I think it is in most cases. But there's a lot of times where it's become another box ticking exercise for many organizations. Yeah, I'm glad you've, I'm glad you've brought that up, actually, because I, I, I see, I don't just feel it, but I see it. I see it a lot that it is just a box ticking exercise. Um, and I don't think necessarily that that's a, a, a malicious thing or an intent that it's mm. just box, but, but that's what it becomes. H how do companies avoid that, though? H how do they get into the, you know, it's all well and good saying, well, what are the values? But again, these are just sort of statements on walls and things. Mm. But, you know, there's a famous comment about Enron. They had some big statement on the wall at, 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 at their sort of headquarters, which is all about integrity. But, you know, the guys got sent down for fraud. You know? So, you know, these are just statements. H how do businesses go about actually meaningfully doing that so it's not just a box ticking exercise it sounds really obvious but i'm going to think how it's take it seriously and i said i think you know what does it mean mm. i think you know, well-being now is is a phrase that's commonly used I when mean, i talk about a lot of the, a lot about this with clients which is that you know once um, a phrase or a word becomes overused it loses its meaning yeah and you know well-being is multifaceted it's multi-dimensional um and what i would be saying to well, saying to, to organizations is don't box tick. Yeah. If you have no intention of really taking into – and I talk about this at a strategic level, the, the well-being of your staff. And I don't just mean in terms – you know, in fairness, I think most organizations over the years have done things like um, gym memberships or, you know, there's lots of different things organizations have done. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's been something that's, that's not considered. I think – that well-being has a new meaning now, mm. or certainly it's extended in terms of what people might be expecting and looking for, particularly because of the aspect of mental health. And I think this is where organizations are wondering, well, what do we do? What, How much of this are we responsible for? Um, so I guess back to the box ticking exercise, I say, don't say and offer things that you cannot do. Mm. Because what you're doing immediately is creating a sense of mistrust. You know, there's nothing more, I mean, a personal kind of peeve of mine is is incongruence, which is, you know, and I work a lot with leaders on this, which is, you know, don't say, you know, don't hand that book out, um, that particular leadership book that you think is is relevant or that you like, and then behave completely the opposite to, yeah. to what that is. Yeah. It's funny because one of the themes that I'd got for us to talk through was that those that say and those mm. that do. And, you know, th that's a, a big theme, I feel, um, because it's not just necessarily in, 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 in the cultural space in the area for which, you, you know, you have particular expertise in, but it's actually across the organization when you're looking at sort of change and transformation. I'd like to sort of just deep dive a little bit on this topic because, or on this particular theme. So people watching and listening to this, many of them will be involved in a, in a current major transformation of some sort. It, it, all businesses are at the minute, it, it, a digital transformation. But what what can they, what, what are the steps that they can be taking to, to help them on that journey? And how important are those steps? I mean, if you were in, what would you be saying to those people? Well, I think it's what's stopping them at the moment. You know, what, what, where, what's the mishap, what's the sort of incongruence between what you're saying and what you're doing? Mm. What is the gap and why is that? Um, because interestingly, if a leader was to talk to me about not box ticking, I'd be saying, well, as a leader of this organization, you, I, what, what are you doing then or not? Mm. One of the biggest things I think I observe is when people want to pass this off to somebody else. Yeah. So what I would be saying to, uh, if it's, if it, I think the box ticking exercise is, is challenging in lots of ways because if you are committed to this, invest in it properly. And back to Alistair something earlier, which is about what does this really mean to you? You know, what is, what is well being? Um, 
what is cultural change about for you or your culture? Mm. Um, if you want to pass this off to somebody else and this become rhetoric, words on walls, et cetera, et cetera, good luck. If this is about fundamentally trying to change something within an organization, I know you talk about changing behaviors. The only way to change behavior is at an individual level. Mm. The first place to change behavior is within the leadership team. Mm. The primary place, certainly in the work that I do to change behavior, is with the person that leads that organization. So a lot of what I do is specifically work with either the founders or the CEOs of the organization to really understand what it is that they are intending to do from a growth perspective. So I get the business concepts, so, you know, contextualization is massively important here because what people think it's either or and it's not, it's growth, business and growth people. Mm -hmm. And it's to understand what it is that they're doing or they're not at that level that's having an impact on the box ticking exercise or not. How does, should these organizations really go about taking care of people when they're, you know, in, in that way? Well, I think it's establishing an, a, a very clear well-being program. Mm -hmm. That's what I work with organizations a lot to do is, is help them define what that is. Um, you know, what are the things they want to include in that? It needs to be aligned. It needs to be integrated. Um, they can be offering uh, access to what we now, something I've set up recently with an organization is um, like call off services. So how might you give your staff access to therapy or wellbeing service and coaching um, that's unique to them? Um, that's completely confidential that they can go and access and get the help that they need at an individual level. Um, in most cases, the, when that's really successful, you know, the, the individuals are left to have that relationship with, mm. with me. Um, we work on various topics. But the point is, there's two things that happen. There are several things actually that happen, which is one, the individual feels hugely invested in by the organization. The other thing they feel is valued because what the organization isn't saying to them is come back and tell us how that went. And they're trying, they're not trying to measure it. Mm. Okay. Metrics really undo engagement in lots of ways, though I totally understand the need to want to feel you're getting something back. So investing in those personal one-to-one -one services is really important. Investing in relationships, though, at leadership level is also really important. You know, leaders really understanding having a far greater level of self-awareness than they've had before. And I'm not talking about just through psychological profiling tools, which, by the way, I uh, think have their value, mm. but it's the then what. The amount of people that come to me and said they've used, it could be you know, Thompson, Disc, Myers-Briggs, all the different ones that are out there. Um, great. They get to understand a bit about themselves, a bit about their colleagues. But what do they do next? Um, they often then come to me and say, well, what does that mean? And so we explore that. But I think, you know, what is it that people can be doing? I think it's investing in the services, defining what they are. But understanding that the the impact that they want to have, and I think that the important thing, certainly one of the things that I find that's relevant and very necessary um, with the leaders that I work with is to say, okay, from a business perspective, what is it you're looking to do? You know, literally I'm asking, it's about people. They say, mm, come in and help yeah. us with our people, come in and help us talk to me about culture. I say, great, tell me about your business first. Okay, what are your growth plans for the next five years? Personally to the CEOs or the founders or the leaders, I'll be saying, what's your, it's interesting, they, they kind of shocked me. I said, what's your exit plan? And I, what do you mean? So I need to understand, I want to understand what are your intentions of being here? What is it you're looking to do? Isn't it really interesting that the responses you get to that? Because obviously I ask it, but in a different context mm. Cause, mm. because of the work that I do. But I always find a resistance and it's almost as if it's like a dirty secret. You well, know, because no one likes... no transparency. No, and people don't like endings. Interesting. And or we're not comfortable with endings. Yeah. And therefore, that's why they're also not maybe comfortable with change themselves. And so what I want to, I often talk about is the need to understand our own. When I say ending, it sounds yeah. extremely final, but it's not. You call it a transition if you want to. Yeah. Okay. But whether you're a founder of a business or a CEO, you know, how, what stage do you want to leave this business in when you go? Yeah. Because it's about taking them all the way forward in their mind. And I'll talk about when I say in their heart, that might sound very fluffy, but I'm going to talk about what that means in terms of the emotional attachment to something or not. But it's like, let's, let's, let's move forward just for a moment. What does the end look like? What state are you leaving the business in when you go? What state are you leaving the business in when you sell it? Mm -hmm. What business are you wanting to hand over or be bought? 
Yeah. What legacy do you want to have or leave behind? Because the moment you begin to understand what their intention is, and this is why it's important at leadership level, like I said, particularly at the CEO, MD, founder type level, yeah, is that when you understand their personal intention, we can then begin to understand their professional intention. And are those two things aligned? Because when those things aren't aligned, and when we begin to see the challenges then in change, and when they might slightly get into box ticking type exercises themselves because they think oh, I know we should be doing that but really what they've not what they've done is got themselves slightly misaligned with their personal intentions and their professional intentions as things have got a little bit blurred and confused and then they start to demonstrate behaviors completely out of awareness that aren't helpful to integration actually in growth mm. <laughs> because what often happens you know even with CEOs or founders it doesn't matter if it's your business or, or you know somebody else's or you know the point is when we get into a new role at leadership level or we've got our, our we're generating our own business, our entrepreneur burnout is something I talk about a lot um, with individuals, is that the beginning's really exciting, yeah? You've just got the CEO role or you're just setting up your business you're with your founders, it's great. The possibilities could be endless. It's exciting. It's fun. There's a few of you, you can get stuff done like, like that. You know, legalities in HR aren't really needed necessarily if you're in the you know, setup world. But, you know, you're in the, you know, if you're the CEO, you're in a new job and it's all exciting again. You know, you want to go make your mark. The real work and the hard work comes when you've got to grow. So whether you're uh, got your own business or whether you're a CEO in an organization, there's this point where, you know, the shareholders or your business plan says we need to grow. Along comes scalability. The scalability challenges that then come up are fascinating, which is why this leadership story of how do you want to leave this is so important. Mm. Because what you need is something to always come back to, you know, whether it be your Northern Star, some people call it like, you know, the the anchor that you keep coming back to. Well, this is where, surely this is where purpose and values come from. Completely, completely. And this is when I think founders and leaders, at least CEOs themselves, can often be, think, can often have a moment of like, oh, I'm, I don't know. Mm. Um, this wasn't about money when I started out, for example. Yeah. Um, this was a uh, love for the product or love for this kind of service or something, an impact I wanted to have on an industry through to then seeing the size and scale of things and getting really stuck in the grittiness of scaling <laughs> and losing interest. I mean, the, the hard work is in scaling. The hard work is yeah. in the big growth bit. And they lose sense of themselves and therefore lose sense sometimes of their purpose and their value. That, I think, definitely permeates into the organizations that they're in because whatever, you know, their most organizations' values, though marketing departments often might be the ones that pull them together, they're fundamentally from leadership usually or their the leader's personal aspect are within those values somewhere. Well, this is where I'm connecting your congruency statement um, and bringing it to sort of life is that from experiences that I witness and see, you think, yeah, that message on the wall, that isn't congruent with reality of mm -hmm. what's actually happening inside of this organization mm -hmm. uh, and sort of, you know, how people are... Um how people are feeling um, and and that lack of transparency is, is such a big deal. I mean, there's so much in what you've just said there that, that's like hugely valuable. One of the things I would like to just, just to pick up on a bit is, is, an, is an experience and you were actually involved in, in, in helping me achieve this in a, in a previous business that I had. And that was that I recall, you know, the, the moment that uh, one of my senior sort of team came to me and said, we had people deployed on sites in, in organizations in, in the banking sector. And they came to me and they said, outright, what we're saying in terms of looking after our people and what we are doing are disjointed was the phrase. Mm -hmm. um, the meaning's well, but we're not looking after them enough. <laughs> Uh, they're remote. They're and and, and this kind of this was way before COVID. But like they're remote. They're, they're all, yes, they're on client site and they're around people. But they're they're the fabric of what we do, and they're trying to you know integrate change and you know, everything. They've got challenges. And I remember things of I need somebody. I need somebody to come in and kind of own this. And I remember talking to you about it, and you used that phrase. And if I'm honest, I'd forgotten all about it. And it's just listening to you kind of go through it, and you sort of saying to me things like, "Look, you know." 
you've got to this this is it this is about ownership you know who's going to own this you've mm-hmm. got to own it as a as, as a board and as a leadership team but somebody's got to be given the responsibility to, to, to not just to look after you own that as well but this has to be integral to your genuine sort of values take care of them so bring somebody in to do it and we developed uh, we developed a way to do that which simply was giving somebody complete autonomy and that was the phrase you should give them the autonomy to go and talk to people on a one-to-one level. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of unheard of to me at the time. This was like four years ago, you know, this was in my mind, this Mm -hmm. was all a bit kind of, I remember my chairman being like, this is, and and I'm just going to be like blunt about it. I'll use it. This is loony stuff. We're we're a business. Yeah. Yeah. It's tree hugging and capstan and flip flop zone, right? Well, well, yeah. And uh, do you know what? Yeah. Do you know what? I'm I'm embarrassed to say it. That's not the way it should have been. But that was genuinely some of the feeling that was there. But the impact that that had was phenomenal. And I, I mentioned it a few weeks ago to some some colleagues I'm doing some work with at the moment, and shared that story of impact. And to, to, to bring it to the sort of the, to, to a head and to the point about sort of those that say and those that do, I've been that person that was saying, but I became the person that did, and I saw the impact. And just listening to your story and and what what you just explained there really does resonate with the importance of one ownership. You know, mm. the leadership team have to own this, understanding their true purpose and values. Um, well, I know we don't know all the detail, but I think we know enough of it. It makes me think of Brewdog and what's gone on yeah, there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, what's kind of being said in terms of person and what's actually happening, you know, there's a classic case study for a disconnect, mm. if anything. Um, and but- these cases are fascinating because my, my interest and curiosity is what got lost. Yeah. And I think that... Um, you know, if they don't know all the ins and outs um, of, of what's what's gone on there, but I, as an observer, I would say that um, the things I've read or the things that I've seen, um, I guess the thing that struck me most of all was I'd seen a post actually from um, I think one of the founders there that I think a very famous one that people seem to be quoting about the orange chair story. Yeah, um, and. I think you know my question was as I would I think if I was I was with him I'd be like where's the guy that bought the orange chair because that is he the one that started this is that did he was he felt was his were his values different at that point or what he wanted his scalability taken over have some misalignment of what he wanted personally and professionally. Um, you know, there could be so many things go on, but I think when you mm. we talk about you know that box ticking, kind of just came to me then that I was thinking, yeah, really most often when I think about why, is because people don't know what to do and how to do this. And I think if you're a leader of an organisation, you know, I've been on boards myself. It's like you think you've got to have the answers all the time. Yeah. I need to know this. You know, one thing, you know, big hats off to so many people that work in HR right now, you know, not just in terms of this sort of new world of or increased interest and importance of well-being and culture, but, you know, all the things that have gone on in the last 12 months, you know, I think everybody's had to adapt. But if there's one if there's one area can, of any can, business... We can say the C word. We've not banned the word COVID, don't worry. <laughs> if there's one department or one function in every organisation that has probably really had to pull the stops out here, it is HR mm. because they are managing... Th- multi uh multiple aspects i guess of people and, and humanity and you know you add this in well the common phrase i heard a lot was this is a shit storm yeah and i think you know not to forget that a lot of stuff gets dumped and let, let hr sort it out yeah. you know, one thing i want to say is you know to, to anybody that works in hr and hr directors you know they don't have to have the answers this is the, the, the point i was making about we don't have to have the answers all the time you're not supposed to actually have the answers all of the time. This is real life, right? Completely. It is real life. And, you know, we we hear a lot more um, people, you know, talking or being open about the term vulnerability. Mm. And I think, you know, I say to people, lean into those vulnerabilities. You know, you've got to rumble with vulnerability to find the courage to yeah. make changes and to do things. Do you think there's a certain element, so it's cut in there, but it just reminds me, you, you know, we talk about HR directs, we talk about sort of owners of businesses. Mm. Is there a sort of an element of a false persona? You know, that, that, that when, you, when you're working with sort of senior execs, sometimes they almost feel, and, and I, you know, I, I can tell a, a personal story. Mm. In one of my last businesses, I the, the objective definitely was build, scale, grow, exit. And mm. it was, uh, there was a financial number. It was about that. It was also about creating something different. We did have a purpose and a value and everything else. 
But I became almost embarrassed about saying this is yeah this is about an exit, and it wasn't until sort of somebody said to me, a mentor of mine said, you know, there's no, there's no shame in kind of wanting to better yourself and seek an exit for a financial reward when you've left this legacy of something great. I mean, it, as it happened, it didn't happen that way. But is there is there an element of false persona, and do people need to sort of tap into that and think, well, actually, am I almost playing up to this persona of oh well? well-being and everything else. I'm not saying that they sh they shouldn't do it, but it, it strikes me that some people are just thinking, well, that's back to box ticking. I kind of need to say this and actually not be honest about the fact that actually I've got this exit strategy. But you can have the two, you know, and they can sit hand in hand. So they kind of come up with this yeah, false I narrative. Because well, I think we, we often do this. I think it's, 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 this is a human thing in general, which is that we have this either or mentality. You know, I talk a lot to people, what about that and... Yeah, yeah, you're talking about what about having financial growth or financial achievement uh, and still being interested in people? You know, I think this is interesting about you know, commercial organizations in general. Well, can we be a growing um, organization and still do the fluffy stuff? Yeah. So, you know, of course. If they go hand in hand. Arguably, if you want to call it the fluffy stuff, I say, if you want to grow, then human growth is the way to do it. Mm. Absolutely, you need clear clarity of your goals and all of the, that good stuff. Yeah, I talked only to today. I think to somebody about numbers. You know, yeah, of course, there's a financial number. Of course, there's somewhere there's a, there's a plan with a with a scale. You know, most organisations that looks like this, right? So, it's where we've got to get to. Whether it be turnover, profitability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a place we're heading on a commercial aspect. But where in that are you doing the bit about taking the people on that journey with you? One of the things that I find most powerful is when a leader um, works with me and actually finds it through those honest conversations and is able to say, I'm not that person actually in terms of the humanity bit. Now, some people might think, crikey, what are they doing being the CEO of an organization? It's not actually the biggest problem. In fact, it isn't a problem when they acknowledge it. It's when they pretend, you talk about the persona, yeah. talk about, we I talk about in these terms, the adapted self. You know, when we over adapt, yeah, there's a small window and it isn't, it is a small window of how sustainable that is. And the problem you've got is unless you're willing to say, do you know what? I'm not very good at that, the people bit. Mm. So I tell you what, I'm going to own that, but I'm still accountable for the people in this organization. So what I am going to do is make sure I get somebody else that's really good at that. And I'm going to put my faith and I'm going to put my trust in them. And I'm actually going to maybe hopefully learn some stuff from them too. But I'm going to stay over here and I'm going to lead this ship in the best way that I can. And one of the best ways I'm going to lead that ship is accept the things that I am not great at, but that are important to me. They can still be important to mm. you. It doesn't mean you have to do them. Now, for some people that work with me, then is, is interesting for them. They're like, oh gosh, am I, you know, not an empath? Am I, it's okay, you know, but the point is, it's getting to the point where I might be having conversations whereby I'm saying that you, that, you know, to the individual, you might not be the person that is able to do all of the cultural stuff and that's okay. But it is important that you are authentic yeah. in your leadership and therefore surround yourself with the people that can, and more importantly, you fully buy into what it is they're telling you needs to then happen as a result. <clears throat> I think there's so much good advice in all of that, Joe. I mean, <laughs> if you could be cloned, I'm sure many people would be wanting to clone you and, and, and put you out there. But one of the things we were talking uh, off, off camera before uh, we started was actually about books and the... Um, how a lot of leadership teams sort of, you know, they'll come across a good book and they'll hand it out. We spoke earlier about how um, the difference between actually saying something and then doing it. But um, I want to get into some sort of recommendations that you would make to sort of, as we kind of draw towards the close of the podcast here, but recommendations and experiences that you can share with the audience that, that they'd find useful. And one of them is sort of on the books front. Uh, one thing that stood out to me was legacy and uh, <laughs> in the book legacy and the phrase, no dickheads. Um, so to tell us a little bit more about that and why, why is that a good book, do you think, for, for, for leaders to be looking at and actually taking note of and actioning themselves? 
Yeah, that's um, it's a really interesting book. A lot of organisations, uh, I think, use and have read and have, have handed out to staff or based their own um, values uh, on. And it's fascinating because when anybody comes to me and works with me and they talk about a book that they like or that is meaningful to them or the organisation, I always say, what are the, tell me something that really sticks out to you from that. <laughs> um, or, or what are the key three things that you've kind of taken away? And no dickheads is the one phrase that I think everybody says says when they talk about legacy. And um, I smile, yeah, but I think what that says a lot to me is that, you know, people are desperate to not work with tickets. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, defining that by, by person or whatever, I'm sure is different. But really what we're saying there is we want to work in a place where we get along with people and we don't want egos and we want to be able to integrate. We want to be able to be ourselves. And well, so the, the, it's interesting because in a previous podcast, um, Howard Tursky talks about this in his book and he calls sort of leading change. You, know, you need a sort of change. He calls it like a superhero. Mm-hmm. And he gave this analogy of like, if we look at superhero stories, forget the egotistical part, but yeah. if you look at sort of superhero stories, almost the best superhero. So it isn't, you know, or the most successful. It isn't Spider-Man. It isn't Batman. It's actually like the, you know, the Marvels that, that, it's, that they're all in this team together. And, and that's so important. This idea that it's all one person or a group, this, it's community, isn't it? It's all about Completely. community. And yeah, I think I heard some adults talk about, you know, how do we build communities rather than businesses? Yeah, I know, yes, they're businesses, but with that mentality, what we're doing is we're, is we're remembering here that we're part of a collective. Mm. Um, and the more that we're able to do that, I think the more we're able to understand and appreciate the, the need for us to become really good at relationships. Yeah. And I think that, you know, when you talk about, you know, no dickheads, well, that's because most pe- anybody that might identify themselves or another as, you know, a dickhead is probably because there's a disconnection there. There is a lack of relationship or a level of relatedness I often talk to people about. You know, why is that? Um, so yeah, how do we create these places whereby we are connected? Um, we are open and honest. And here's the other thing, yeah, is that how do we have difficult conversations still? Because mm. let's be frank, this isn't all about, you know, yes, the ambition might be a level of harmony, but the reality of human life, two things I talk about, you know, to confront reality here, which is life is full of suffering. <laughs> yeah, which it wasn't at times, but it is. The other thing is, is difference. And the more we are able to accept and understand and educate ourselves to work with difference and to work with suffering and challenge, then the more able and open we are to continue to have relationships, even through difficulty. Yeah. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. Fascinating. What I'd I'd like to turn to now is is benefits. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a couple of sort of things as we draw to a close now, and one of them is benefits. What are you... What are the benefits, the real true benefits of, of, of investing in in, 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 in in the stuff that all the stuff that we've been mm. talking about? Because for people listening to this and watching it, I'm sure that they're sort of sat there saying, well, you know, what, what are the tangible things that are going to come out of this? And I, I, and I could reel off a ton, but I'm sure you've got loads there. But what, what are those benefits, Joe? Well, it's, it's, it's very multifaceted, but I think trying to, to, to kind of keep it the top few things is that, you know, when people feel invested in and valued, the the, the impact is huge. You know, people need to feel important mm. and or valued. And I think when an organisation invests in, it, particularly properly in well being and in individuals, they feel like they matter. Yeah, so it's a message that it creates. The other thing it's really helpful for is talent acquisition, for managing churn. Um, sickness absence is a huge one. Um, you know, the amount of people I have worked with who are potentially on the cusp of my either being signed off sick, maybe for a period of time, um, is, I guess you couldn't even begin to talk about in terms of what they, what they've needed to just find some rebalance to be able to stay in organizations. The other benefit here is that, you know, managing people that might leave that you don't want to. Um, identifying people that might not want to be in an organization anymore, but they aren't making the, you're taking an action, if you like, to, to want to do something about it. So they become disruptive. You know, that can they be. They become a dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly, um, but the point is, it's uh, yeah, it's that the people then find the ability to start to make adult decisions. I talk a lot about you know taking adult responsibility for ourselves and making adult decisions about yeah. things. Um, 
I think the other thing is is about intervention and prevention, which is what I talk about a lot. You know, if you invest in this up front um, and it becomes part of your strategy, then what you're doing is with an intervention and prevention approach, you are less likely to have the knock-on effect of serious long-term illness, for example, where we're talking about mental health. From a cultural aspect, you're able to understand far more quickly uh, the themes that might be coming out in sessions people have with me. Um, so there's, there's multiple factors. Um, I think that's a big one, though, for me, because, again, you know, we talk about the, the, the brew dog story earlier. If mm-hmm. they'd had levels like this of these types of interventions, this stuff would have been coming to the surface. You'd, yeah. you'd like to think a lot, a lot sooner. Uh, yeah, the other thing is for me, is secondly, is the fact that when I look at companies that are going through transformation and change, and we look at that behavioural piece and kind of the impact of it, you've got to, you stand a much better chance of actually succeeding in the long term, the medium, and the short term if you've got all of this stuff in check. And the, the, surely that's for me, you know, big takeaway is, is look, this is so important because the benefit is is that if we've got people being taken care of, we've got all these mm-hmm. stuffs, uh, all th- this stuff in play, mm-hmm. then we can see what's going on. Yeah. Th- that transparency is there, and we're all focused on the same end goal yeah and that congruency exists throughout the business yeah which is why it has to be committed to and invested in properly you know this is why i talk about being able to you know having the advantage to be able to wear sort of my old sort of strategic hat and the psychology hat because what this fundamentally is about moving forward i think this is where now your organizations are going to have create competitive advantage or not yeah. So that's a big one. Is that interesting? Huge competitive advantage. And I think, you know, just I've made a couple of notes here, actually, because if you, you know, just to give to, so for people to take away, you know, domains of well being, there's, there's a lot of them, but you can decide what they are for your business. You know, there's like nine. Um, but very quickly, you know, if you want to no, no, say, like, yeah, let's you know, what is, because people, are, you know, so many, we talked about well being early and what does it mean? I say it's different things sometimes to different people. It's become such an, you know, an overused word in some ways, it it's, can lose its meaning. If you're an organization, and you want to define what well-being is. Just here are some of the things that it covers. Okay, so these are what I call the domains domains of well-being. You've got physical, you've got mental, social, psychological, financial, intellectual, emotional, occupational, and spiritual. So there's nine there. There's a lot now. For some organisation, I think crikey, do we need to cover all of those in terms of well-being? No. Very simple. I'm just going to say. So for example, physical. You might already be doing something with gym and health, and yeah. people just have free fruit in the office, things like that. Fantastic. The point being is when I work with people, I say, okay, of these domains, what are the most important to you? And actually, what is it that your organization need to work on with for those uh, things? Because really what, what you know, well-being is all about is satisfactory and desirable state of existence. Mm. That's what it, it it's defined as really. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think when you're able to understand what which of those domains are most important to you in line with your goal, your commercial goals, your business goals, then you can start to talk about alignment today quite a bit. You can then align um, your growth with that, with those domains or get domains to align with the growth plan. Um, but yeah, that competitive advantage is really important because moving forward, you've already begun to see, I think on the back of last year, organizations now that are saying, oh no, we want everybody back in the office. Mm-hmm. We're not sure whether we want to commit to mm-hmm. flexible working in the same way, already having an impact. And what people I think have begun more than anything now is to say, okay, how much monetary of, of financial value is there in my role and my pay packet and my benefits compared to my life and and, and the way I live and my well-being. Yeah. And so I guess as there's a shift in personal desire, you will begin to see a shift then in what organizations might need to start to offer people um, in terms of supporting that. Brilliant. And finally, what would be the top three things that sort of you would say to a company that they should be doing right now to make an impact and a difference? Well, I think these are the, uh, again, taken from kind of my old strategy world in a way, but um, I, I love them for their simplicity, which is, first of all, I always say diagnostics. So, with individual or a, a group level, you know, do the diagnostic work. You know, what are the issues? Understand what your issues or challenges are. I talked to you about establishing the need. You know, establish your need because, again, back to not box ticking. Don't just get somebody in and say, we want to be good at well being. What can yeah. you do? Um, you know, what is relevance? Accuracy, clarity, yeah. Try and find out what that is for you. Whether you know, work with HR, look at your surveys, you know, interviews, whatever that is. But establish the need and do the diagnostics first. 
create a guiding policy around a strategy of well-being. What is that for you? You know, take this seriously at board level as much as you talk about your commercial growth plans. You know, how are we going to address this? Whatever you find in the diagnostics, what are you going to do to address it? Is it a pilot scheme? Are you going to do it internally? Are you going to get external support? Um, you know, what services do you think you can make available or do you want to make available to your people? Then finally, cohesive action. And this is very much about commitment. You design the services that are joined up. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, is it group work? Is it individual? Um, you know, it's not a webinar and a few workshops. You know, this is really getting into something that's committed over a long period of time. Um, that's consistent. It's as much as like you do your appraisals every year or you say review, th review your growth plans. But, you know, take cohesive action, be committed to it, communicate and definitely have a feedback mechanism to keep moving around that diagnostics, guiding policy, cohesive action. Joe, this has been fabulous. Thanks ever so much for uh, joining me today as ever. Pleasure. Really, really appreciate your time. Look, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that wouldn't mind perhaps maybe reaching out and, and Sort of by maybe having a conversation with it. where should people go if they want to ask any questions or, or, or even inquire about the stuff that you do LinkedIn would be the best place so yeah let, uh, connect with me give me a shout drop me a DM I'd be happy to, to chat and talk more talk about this for ages so yeah Brilliant. Joe, thanks ever so much. It's been a pleasure as always. Uh, we'll pop to Joe's uh, LinkedIn um, profile link uh, uh, below this video somewhere. Uh, thanks again for listening to the Digital Disruption Podcast. Uh, that's been Joe Williams. Thank you. <laughs>